Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wafa Al Daily. I am a senior uh, professional uh, in urban planning and uh, professional, uh, I mean, uh, international development. Um, bringing almost about two decades of um, work experience in uh, urbanization, uh, different areas, diverse, diverse uh, topics uh, related also to uh, metropolitan uh, planning, governance, and uh, management. Um, addressing uh, other issues related to fragility, anti-fragility, e-governance, uh, disaster risk management, and uh, reduction and the challenges of uh, informal settlements. It's a pleasure today to be um, the moderator of this uh, esteemed panel with me, addressing uh, the Gulf's ambitious climate uh, action, focusing on uh, renewables, green policies, and uh, emission reduction. Uh, joined uh, by our esteemed um, uh, panelists uh, today, and the discussion, uh, I think, it's timely and significant, especially because uh, it's uh, placed within the uh, uh, two major events taking place in um, Gulf countries. One is the uh, uh, is the uh, MENA uh, Climate uh, Week, which took place in Saudi Arabia last uh, October and the COP28, which will take place in um, United Arab Emirates in December uh, 6. So the GCC uh, states have embarked um, uh, on a commendable journey towards sustainable uh, future, marking, marked by a firm commitment uh, for renewable energy, uh, green policies, and um, the uh, emission reduction driven by uh, confluence of envir environmental imperatives, uh, economic diversification aspirations, and uh, a diverse um, uh, desire to establish uh, themselves as a global uh, lead in sustainability and uh, being a pioneer. The Gulf uh, states uh, are undergoing uh, uh, an aggressive transformation towards a low carbon economy with an ambitious goal to achieve uh, carbon neutrality uh, either before um, 2045 uh, or 2050. So with this ambitious plan, many um, argue that GCC's countries and uh, states diversification plan like the Saudi um, 2030 vision exemplify itself as the balance driving energy diversification while managing the existing oil economy. Uh, the state's efforts reflect a broader regional um, uh, trend, carefully transitioning from the um, traditional uh, energy dependencies on uh, oil to a more uh, ambitious future uh, for, uh, with sustainable um, uh, energy. This strategic uh, shift not only enhancing uh, environmental uh, sustainability, but also contributes to economic resilience and growth. One, uh, of the, uh, one of the things that also the um, uh, GCC has the commitment uh, to the uh, Paris Agreement and also uh, active participation in international sustainability effort. We have the four esteemed speakers. They will uh, have their insightful um, opinions and uh, contributions to the topic. We're starting with um, uh, Her Excellency Princess Nora bint uh, Turkey Al, uh, Al Saud, who is the founding partner of Ion Strategy. And as an advocate of sustainable and equitable um, development, she is also a co-founder of uh, Ion Collective. She has previously held the role of assistant director at the King Faisal Center for Research. Uh, which is a think tank based in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, where she also headed the unit on energy studies focusing on geopolitics uh, of energy and energy uh, markets. Then we have in my left, uh, Dr. Ma, uh, Sara uh, Fakhshuri is the founder uh, and the president of SV, SVB Energy International, a strategic uh, energy consulting firm with uh, offices in Washington, D.C. and Dubai. She is also an adjunct uh, professor of energy security at the Institute of World Politics. Dr. Uh, Fakhshuri has about two decades of uh, work experience on energy industry with extensive experience in global energy market studies, energy security, and uh, geopolitical risk. 
And I have at the end of the table, Mr. Ben uh, Cahir. He is a senior fellow in the Energy Security and Climate Change Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. He covers oil markets, geopolitics, and macro trends affecting the oil and gas industry. He also leads a research initiative on uh, methane emission and global gas and analyzing how national oil companies are responding to the uh, energy transition. Ben uh, was previously uh, a director in Energy Intelligence's Research and Advisory Group. And last but not least, our uh, Dr. Um, uh, Gaudet Bahgat, he is a professor of National Security Affairs at the National Defense University's Near East South Asia Center for uh, Strategic Study and a senior uh, non-resident fellow at the Gulf International Forum. Dr. Bahgat is an Egyptian-born specialist in Middle Eastern uh, policy, particularly Egypt, Iran, and the Gulf region. He, uh, his area of expertise include energy security, uh, profil proliferation, uh, proliferation of weapons of mass uh, destruction, counter-terrorism, Arab-Israeli conflict, North Africa, and uh, the American foreign policy in the Middle East. So a few housekeeping for our um, session today. Um, Q and A's will be at the end of the, of the session. After our esteemed speakers, they finish their, um, uh, their points. Um, any questions from the audience can be written in the cards that you have, I think, on chairs. So you can write the uh, question in there, and it can be handed uh, to, uh, to us. And then each speaker will have uh, seven minutes to answer the, the questions, including uh, Princess Nora, and uh, uh, she is joining us virtually. So uh, with that, I think we will start our um, session. Be some questions to um, Her Excellency Princess Nora. Welcome um, with us, and thank you for staying up too late tonight in Saudi Arabia. Uh, enjoying our uh, our session, I appreciate that. So, it's a pleasure to be here with you, and thank you to Dr. Dania and Anas for putting all of this together and for inviting me to participate here on this panel. Sure, we are uh, pleased to have you on the session and have also your insights about the topic for uh, for today. So, uh, the first question will be: Can you share an example from your experience where you had to navigate? the intersection of energy policy, sustainability, and international cooperation. What challenges do sustainability projects face in Saudi Arabia and other GCC states, and how can the private sector overcome them? Of course, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wafa. Um, I'll quickly answer your question, but then I think I want to zoom out a little and give and contextualize um, your question a little more to, to, to show exactly where we are today and how we got to where we are today. I think one of the biggest challenges is how do you um, address some of the, the imminent challenges that we face today in terms of need, the need to, to diversify our economy, the need to, um, uh, to develop economically, to develop socially as well, while being sustainable and more importantly, regenerative. And I think that's really to answer your question in a nutshell and very direct but I think more importantly is to understand the context in which we operate and how we got here. And the way I see it is that it's been it's a continuum. There have been series of events um, uh, and incidents that occurred and also dynamics that have changed on the global arena that has led to where we are today. As you know very well, and you've alluded to this, Saudi is an oil producing country. We are our GDP highly dependent on oil production and oil revenues. We've been a rentier state for the longest time. Um, in each development, five-year development plan, the country has always aspired to diversify its economy, but due to the challenges that that, that itself entails, um, there has been difficulties in really achieving that goal. All of this, of course, changed uh, with the launch of Vision 2030 in 2015 and 2016, where there was a clear signal from um, the government, from our leadership towards a new modus operandi, and that we are taking a, a, a clear and we have a clear pathway, a clear blueprint to really developing our economy and developing um, the country in a way that hopefully is sustainable, but also attuned to the realities um, of, of, of today. And I think there, of course, the realization that we cannot 
um, rely on oil as a single source of income for our country is, of course, something in part in the, one of the most critical um, uh, issues that led us to where we are today. But there are also a lot of geopolitical factors, social dynamics, social changes that have led to where we are now. Like if we look from a, from a domestic perspective, um, the demographical changes that have happened in the country, the population boom that have occurred in the country, these are all big um, changes and dynamics that has really um, led our government to really take a serious look uh, and take this upon themselves to really take a, a stringent approach, um, one that provides opportunity, but also uh, means discipline, right? Um, and I think maybe taking it a step back a little, um, one thing that also uh, nudged this action is, is uh, the kingdom's uh, demand in of itself for energy and what that meant in terms of oil exports for the country. So that also was a big factor in terms of pushing us towards becoming more um, more sustainable in our practices and our consumption, um, the rise of the importance of energy efficiency and whatnot. Um, come 2015, there was, of course, the historical Paris Agreement, which really brought everyone on the table to agree on a pathway forward in terms of managing emissions and reducing emissions in order to stabilize uh, global temperatures to well below two degrees. And this was a significant turning point, I think, for the global economy and really brought all, brought all countries together. I often you know, hear about what happened pre-COP21 and how things change pre-COP21. Uh, and I think the, 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 the most important factor here is really that it was a whole of a society approach and the, the COP presidency really managed to bring in the private sector, the financial sector, uh, the nonprofit sector, not just the politicians and not only the decision makers who are confined towards these in these um, negotiation rooms. And I think that really changed the dial when it comes to the seriousness of taking um, of climate action. And really, and I think that really also for Saudi Arabia and for the GCC. Um, it really, I wouldn't say it it, it it changed everything because these were a lot of things that we were thinking about in the future, but it's also, I think it was more of a, of, of a push uh, towards taking action and being more proactive as opposed to reactive to what's happening um, internationally. Um, I'm not sure how I am on time, but maybe two more points that I can mention in, in, in major shifts and events that happened in the kingdom as well is um, around 2019 and then 2020, uh, with the appointment of Prince Abdelaziz bin Salman as the Minister of Energy, who is really who really took this comprehensive whole of society approach to addressing ener the, the, the energy transition challenge, as well as the climate challenge, uh, with the announcement of the circular carbon economy, which really takes a pragmatic approach in what we see as an oil producing country in a way uh, as a way to manage emissions, while uh, maintaining our revenues and the benefits that um, oil and gas bring with it. And then finally, there was the SGI, which is a Saudi Green Initiative and the Middle East Green Initiative that was announced in 2021. And that in of itself really set uh, the direction towards decarbonization, and it really brought, you know, the society as a whole. So other than just having this top-down approach from ministries and the public sector, um, it really brought the private sector, it, smaller institutions, SMEs, the individual schools, the youth, everyone towards this goal of net zero targets, not only, and this is not only with the SGI, it wasn't only about climate change, but it was all of, it was about the triple planetary crisis, everything from biodiversity and managing biodiversity loss to managing pollutions and all of the negative impacts that come with pollutions, in addition to, of course, um, climate emissions. So I'll leave it at that, and, and I'm happy to dig deeper into uh, more of these topics and issues in the in the discussion. Thank you so much. And uh, you're right about the um, social change. Whenever there is social social change, there is a demand to change everything within the uh, the society. With the climate change, we are all responsible for bringing the best out of us for our uh, future generations. With the uh, uh, promising vision that we have from uh, Gulf countries. Uh, like for the um, uh, energy efficiency and uh, carbon capture technologies that uh, most of the um, uh, Gulf countries that are investing on, on that direction, that's a good direction. We have, let's say, for the um, uh, Qatar, they aim at 20% uh, of its electricity to be renewable energy source by 2030. Saudi Arabia, 50%, and we have the United Arab Emirates, 44% out of this. 
So um, appreciate that uh, vision and also insight, uh, Princess uh, Nora. And I think the second question will be, if you can address that uh, really quick, uh, given your experience advising on energy policy and sustainability, could you provide insights into the evolving landscape of uh, clean energy and its impact on both economic development and environmental sustainability? How do you see international energy markets shifting in response to clean energy trans transition? Um, I think when we talk about clean energy, there are two components to this. There's a renewable energy component, and then there's the existing traditional sources of energy. Uh, but um, conducting that in a way that has less emissions or less impact. So low carbon hydrogen, um, carbon capture for, for um, natural gas, and the same for oil production, so sequestration um, of, of that uh, carbon. Um, and I think specifically, you know, with the developments of what happened and what came out of Paris, particularly with the, with the completion of the Paris rule book, a couple of years ago, I think there has been a lot of developments when it came to energy markets. When we look at renewables per se, um, they did take off. They've been taken off for a while. You know, the costs have gone down to 90% since, you know, in the past uh, 15 to 20 years. Same goes for batteries. The battery batteries are following suit. But again, when we're talking about renewables, a lot of people forget that renewables are only part, you know, they may, they are contributing to the power sector. The power sector itself makes 20, makes up 20% 20, 20 of final global energy demand. But where is the remaining 80%, right? Where is all of that energy, where is that energy demand coming from? So there are other sources which are currently covered by fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal. And if we look at what's happening in global energy markets or demand for energy or sources of energy, it's constantly, you're constantly looking at, if you look at that graph, it's just constantly expanding, expanding. And it's it's not really, you're not even seeing reductions in oil or gas demand or even coal demand. Because if it is, it is in, in fact, you know, going down in terms of demand in Western in Western countries, but it's going up in terms of demand in, in, in Southeast Asia and in other countries. So I think what we're looking at today in terms of global energy market is is a an expanding energy market. It's an expanding energy market where you have new players, but the old players are still there. The old players are still there. They're very strong and they're very much part of 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 the game. Um, there has been a lot of pressure on them to decarbonize and to become more sustainable in their practices, to manage emissions. And I think that is where the role of um, the negotiations under UNFCCC comes along and comes to play, in addition to um, policies, national policies and regional policies that really are um, driving these policies forwards or these goals and targets forward. Because what happens in negotiation rooms, if they're not translated and trickled down into the policy sphere and the policy arena on a national level, then none of this is going to happen. So it's really this changing dynamic. And what we're seeing is really and, and what we, you know, the, the aim is and the goal is to, in the foreseeable future, oil and gas and fossil fuels will be playing a role. But how can we make sure that the oil and gas continue to play a role in a way that is less detrimental to, to our ecosystems and, and to society as a whole? Um, and I think this, this is, you know, this is constantly an, an evolving space. Uh, and it's about the seriousness. How serious are the policymakers uh, are today in terms of putting the right policies, putting the the the, the incentives in place to really drive clean energy? Um, Mr. Reminder, not, uh, Francis, Francis if, you can, if you can conclude uh, the uh, answer, that would be great because we uh, we need to uh, have the other uh, panelists uh, with their questions. Of course, yeah, uh, I ended with that uh, with that point on both Thank looking you. at supply and demand. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, we would appreciate if you can stay uh, along with us uh, towards the end so we can have more questions to you from the audience. Thank you very much. Now we will have a uh, question to you, Sarah, Dr. Sarah. So considering your insights into the Iranian energy industry and the broader Gulf region, how do you proceed? the balance the Gulf nations need to uh, strike between their historically oil-dependent economies and their current ambition for drastic emission reduction. So what innovative strategies or economic uh, restructuring might be necessarily to achieve their climate goals without compromising economic growth? Sure. Um, it's a pleasure for me to be here. 
Um, when we are talking about Gulf, obviously there are many different countries and each one has different uh, status when it comes to their um, both energy and climate agenda. And uh, um, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Oman, uh, I would say being like uh, some of the leading ones, uh, especially Saudi Arabia, Princess Nora referred to some of the um, plans and uh, strategies that the kingdom has, and it's been uh, really quite exciting uh, to follow, uh, follow them from the demographic change that uh, Princess Nora referred uh, from um, 2017. To, um, amazing that there were only two women uh, in the uh, Ministry of Energy and now there are about 400 women uh, actively working in the energy industry. To the whole strategy that uh, a combination of um, having a clear pragmatic understanding of where is going to be the role of fossil fuel because um, again uh, even if you're looking at electrification the cover of the wires is plastic if you're looking at um, alternate I mean re changing all the cars combustion engines to uh, electric uh, EVs we still need oil uh, in petrochemicals so to have that um, clear understanding of uh, where the demand is for fossil fuel, but also have a responsible production of that uh, into that cir uh, circular carbon economy that was mentioned, for instance, in Saudi Arabia, but also the investment that these countries are putting in uh, renewables. Uh, Saudi Arabia is now one of the lowest cost producer of uh, clean energy and uh, green uh, power generation. Looking at UAE, uh, I would say that, um, again, Master City, the innovation, investment in innovation uh, has been there for uh, years now. And uh, um, countries in the Gulf often, like UAE, uh, Saudi Arabia, and many others are uh, desalinating their water, which uh, uses a lot of energy. So bringing all these innovative uh, technologies. And uh, UAE, that is now hosting uh, COP28 uh, this year, the actually have a comprehensive vision and a strategy for their demand management, which many countries in the world don't have. And often, most of the discussions when we are talking about energy transition is focused only on supply, how the supply should look like and not the demand. And having countries, again, Gulf countries, countries like UAE having a solid strategy for their demand management or again going back to Saudi Arabia to looking into the materials that we are using and having a strategies for having a more uh, reliable and sustainable and responsible uh, ways of using those uh, materials we are using. Countries like Oman that uh, the Ministry of Energy in Oman, uh, it was mentioned that the, uh, the approach in the Gulf is usually top to down uh, that they're focusing a lot on green uh, hydrogen now. So I think great things are happening, but Gulf, again, is not one uh, country, and each one, some are further, some are uh, behind, but I think the financing issues that this COP is going to uh, um, cover that, that how we could have this financing for energy transition to allow the countries that are far behind or have lack of access to investment to catch up uh, with the other countries, both with the balance between uh, focusing on uh, supply demand and management uh, in terms of transition, but also to have uh, a clear and pragmatic understanding of uh, what are the fuel that we need in future, because we obviously are not going to be dependent, as again, I was mentioned, 100% uh, on renewable. So how could we still have that sustainable investment, both in renewables, but also in uh, um, fossil fuel, but have that in terms of more sustainable and reliable and environmental friendly manners, it's uh, are all important. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, some important issues, including inclu inclusivity, innovative technology, comprehensive strategies. These are very important issues that we need to consider while planning for the future. For the COP27, they emphasize on the finance. Finance is very important. Other countries, uh, they are lacking behind. Some uh, countries, they are further uh, you know, moving forward. So with having uh, sustainable finance is very critical to move forward and do the, um, you know, the right uh, things for climate action so we don't affect the planet anymore as we do every day. So, thank you, Dr. Sara. Moving to uh, Ben, uh, the question uh, for you. 
uh, you extensively uh, covered major national oil companies like Saudi Aram Aramco and Abu Dhabi National Oil Company. As the energy transition gains momentum, how are these oil giants adapting their strategies and operations to align with a more sustainable energy future? Are there specific initiatives or models that have caught your attention? Thank you, Dr. Wafa, and thank you to the Gulf International Forum for the, the invitation to be here today. Um, I have been thinking a lot about the role of, of national oil companies in this transition, including the NOCs from the Gulf. Um, but before getting to NOCs, I just want to underscore a point that you made at the outset, I think, which is that right across the GCC, all the countries, with the exception of Qatar, I believe, have net zero goals now. Those net zero goals are 2050 for Oman and the UAE, and 2060 for Bahrain, uh, Kuwait, and, and Saudi Arabia. And so the NOCs are a really important instrument to help reach those net zero goals. And the way that they act, the targets that they set, is very much aligned with state, state goals. So the fact that governments have made this a big priority in the last couple of years, they've stepped up and made these net zero commitments, means that the NOCs have to change the way they do business. Um, but they're not going to stop producing oil or natural gas for a very long time to come. And in fact, the big companies have expansion plans. If you look around the world, there's a lot of concern about underinvesting in fossil fuels. Uh, as Sarah just mentioned, there's so much uncertainty about the long-term pathway for oil demand how much demand will be destroyed through electric vehicle adoption, through electrification of heating and buildings, all these big changes in the global energy system. And there's been this concern that we're overestimating the pace of the energy transition and we will underinvest in fossil fuels. And I think the policymakers from the Gulf states have been pretty clear about this from the beginning. They really thought that in the US and in Europe, policymakers are making a mistake. You know, they're underestimating how quickly we can pull this whole thing off and they say, look, we're going to invest over the long term, and the rest of the world should be investing too, because the Gulf states can't do it on our own. Um, in terms of some details about those expansion plans, Saudi Aramco is in the middle of expanding its production capacity from 11 million barrels a day to 13.5 million barrels a day by the year 2027, mostly through offshore developments. And ADNOC uh, and partners in the UAE is on its way to producing 5 million barrels a day by 2027, from about 4.5 now. Um, not many companies around the world have expansion plans on this scale. So it's a big deal to be investing this much right now. Um, and those net zero pledges that I mentioned, both for states and for NOCs, they don't conflict with this idea of producing and exporting more oil. That's really critical to understand. So if you make a scope one or scope two commitment, that means you want to cut emissions from your own operations and from the fuels that you buy to do your business. It does not mean that you're making a scope three commitment, which is helping the world consume less fossil fuels. No NOC is gonna do that, certainly not the ones from the Gulf. From their perspective, they have huge advantages because they have large scale, low cost, low carbon intensity resources. And even if oil demand diminishes over the long term, these are the most advantaged producers. So what are they gonna do about it? You know, the long term shift away from fossil fuels represents a really critical threat to all oil companies around the world. No one can ignore it. Every company needs a plan to be Paris Agreement compliant. Um, it's gonna affect all NOCs, big and small. And I see national oil companies evolving along different pathways. You know, some are gonna become more diversified players. They will invest in renewable energy. They'll invest in things adjacent to, to fossil fuels like hydrogen, carbon capture utilization and storage. Uh, others are gonna be traditionalists. They're gonna say, well, that's fine for other people. We don't really have a comparative advantage in doing that. We're just gonna do oil and gas. That's what we know. That's what my government wants me to do. Um, and some NOCs are just going to be left behind. They're going to lose partners, they'll lose uh, equity partners, access to finance. Um, they'll be left behind in this transition, and many of them are going to struggle. The Gulf NOCs have huge advantages, right? They have, again, big assets, low production costs, they have ample cash, they can strike partnerships wherever they need it because so many people want access to resources and to partnerships in the Gulf. And they have the ability to move fast and pivot, and that is really unique in the whole energy landscape. So what they want to do is decarbonize their operations. I was at the ADEPEC conference in Abu Dhabi last month. The whole theme of the conference was decarbonizing faster together. It did not feel like an oil and gas conference. It felt like a decarbonization conference. There was a hydrogen pavilion. Every single panel talked about decarbonization. It was this obsessive theme throughout the conference. And that kind of shows where the, the NOCs are heading. 
They want to cut the uh, energy associated with the oil and gas that they produce by using renewable energy, even nuclear energy in the case of, of uh, ADNOC in the UAE. Um, and they, they're not doing this alone. You know, the, the unique thing about these companies in the Gulf is that they're part of this broader constellation of state companies, state investment funds. Um, think of the UAE, for example. It's not just ADNOC. You have Mubadala, you have ADQ, um, Mastar. You know, all of these companies are instruments to help the governments achieve what they want. So many of the investments in renewable energy, for example, they're not gonna come from Saudi Aramco or from ADNOC. They're mostly gonna come from Mastar and from ADQ and from these others. And I see that the, the Gulf states are really stepping up to finance more clean energy projects, especially in um, Sub-Saharan Africa and elsewhere in the Middle East. You can see this with Mastar's announcements of projects this year. They have a 10 gigawatt uh, perspective project in offshore wind in Egypt. They're investing in Malaysia, Indonesia, Azerbaijan, Uzbekistan. Um, and you know, this is basically the UAE trying to put its money where the mouth is where its mouth is and try to actually invest big dollars to show they know the world needs climate finance and they have the capital to do it and they have the desire to sort of bring the world along. I, I do think there's still this kind of dated idea that the Gulf states are just oil and gas producers, but they're big sources of capital and that's really needed for this energy transition. And I think not so much the NOCs, but the other Gulf companies are gonna step up and do that. Um, the last thing I'll say is, when you think about big renewable energy projects in the Gulf, and there are already a lot underway and we're gonna see more of them, it's done in a different way than in the United States and Europe. The test here, I think, is if state companies can pull off these kinds of projects rather than the private sector. And remember, in many cases, these are relatively new companies. They don't really have that long a track record with building offshore wind, for example. Um, they certainly have the capital to do it. But the model that they're using is actually more like the Chinese model than the US or European model. We've got a bunch of private companies, small operators, and you aggregate it up. These are big investments by a small number of companies. And so there's the risk of cost overruns and delays, but that's the approach that they're taking. Um, I think I'll stop there and look forward to the discussion. Sure, thank you very much for the insightful uh, uh, points that you discussed and uh, you mentioned. So I think um, there is the business profit and gain versus public goods. So whenever they think about these two things, sometimes there is a conflict and sometimes there is an agreement. And always uh, we need to have an international push for everyone to be on the same track and also uh, heading one aim, like we have the sustainable development goals and we have a certain bracket of time that we need to achieve these goals by that time which we're still lacking and we are, st we are still a way behind of achieving all these sustainable development goals, in including the climate change uh, actions and all that. So um, uh, no one will be left behind, I think, or no country should be left behind. And we need all to um, uh, do things, but it depends on you know, the will of the countries, the political wills at the end. So go, coming back to uh, you, Dr. Bahgat, um, if you um, can give, uh, give me uh, your insights about um, the uh, Gulf regions now is moving through a significant influence uh, in oil markets and its interwind geopolitical considerations. How do you see the transition to renewable uh, and green energy reshaping the region's political and economic landscape in the next decade or so, and how do these changes pose risks or opportunities for global oil and gas companies? Thank you, and uh, before I say anything, because I work for the government, everything I say is my own opinion, does not represent the official policy of Department of Defense or United States government. I will try to uh, summarize everything in five, six minutes. Uh, and I will start with uh, very classic say by former uh, uh, Saudi oil minister, the late uh, Ahmed Zaki Yamani. Uh, famously, he said uh, the Stone Age ended not because the world ran out of stone, but because better uh, source of energy came out. Uh, the same thing uh, about renewable energy and nuclear power. Uh, the, in the last 
10, 20 years, uh, there is a consensus all over the world that uh, there is global warming and uh, we have to do something about it. And uh, Gulf states are not exception. They uh, see the writing on the wall uh, about in 2019, about four years ago, IMF estimated that uh, every year uh, disasters related to climate change cost about $2 billion in the Middle East and impact the life of about 7 million people in the Middle East. So uh, the point here is there is uh, climate uh, emergency. This is fact, and Gulf states uh, do not dispute this fact. But at the same time, they see that there is need to balance this climate emergency with the need for economic development, the need for jobs. So uh, as many of my colleagues mentioned, uh, there is need for oil and gas. Uh, we are not ready yet to uh, make a fast, uh, unplanned transition to renewable energy, to alternative energy. We don't have enough yet. The world needs oil and gas. And uh, even here in the United States, uh, US oil and gas are at its highest level. So uh, Gulf states are investing in uh, alternative energy, and they are very well positioned. Uh, it, is, it is kind of half joke that the sun is out 24 hours in the Gulf. Uh, they have the natural resources, the financial resources, the political will, and they are making this transition uh, in gradual, balanced way. This is my first point. My second point, and I will spend a couple of minutes about, uh, about this, the geopolitical challenges. Uh, we, the war in Ukraine, for sure, major challenge because uh, Western countries, US and Europe, uh, are imposing sanctions on Russia, and uh, Europe and Europe has went to the Middle East Qatar, Saudi Arabia, UAE, Kuwait, Azerbaijan, other countries, to fill the gap uh, created by uh, Russia taking out Russia's gas and oil. Uh, the war in Gaza, uh, Iran uh, proposed to impose oil embargo on Israel, and uh, Gulf states uh, rightly pushed against this idea because basically when it, it was done 1973, it did not work. And uh, it, it, the challenge, if the war in Gaza will expand, uh, this will, be, uh, will have big impact on oil and gas all over the world. Uh, Europe and the whole world needs uh, oil and gas from East Mediterranean. Uh, China needs oil from the Middle East. Nobody would like the war to extend. Uh, and the, if it happens, this will have huge impact. Till today, the war in Gaza has had very limited impact on oil and gas. One important point nobody mentioned today, uh, huge uh, geopolitical impact if we are in Washington, if President Trump get re-elected. Uh, this might increase confrontation between U.S. and Iran. Uh, there, there are a great deal of uncertainties uh, with the United States who are in November. Next year, around this time, we'll have election. So there is a great deal of uncertainty with U.S. Uh, election. Uh, my last point, what can be happen? The recommendation, I believe Gulf states are doing the right thing investing in human capital. Uh, according to World Bank, uh, the Middle East has the lowest rate of women employment 
and the highest rate of youth unemployment. And I'm glad in the conference today there are many young women and uh, all over the Gulf uh, there is silent revolution, educational revolution, uh, better education to uh, Gulf citizens. And I believe this is the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, I think you addressed a uh, few critical points as we, uh, we live now in uh, this unprecedented um, uh, challenges for our world. We have the, also the growth of uh, natural uh, disasters besides the human-made disasters. So we are uh, ready to receive anything and everything. So we're, we're ready for that, I think. <laughs> but as you mentioned, m uh, the world is not ready yet for the transition. We always have these ambitious, ambitious plans, but if we come through to reality, it's not going to do the, you know, to reach this point at that time because we're not ready. Policies are not ready. Uh, countries are not ready. Not all countries are equal in, in their uh, uh, policies or in their um, desire to make the, the change. Uh, we say, like, um, in urban planning, uh, we have the um, smart cities development now. They are rocket science. They're going uh, somewhere on the, on, on the sky, I would say. But if you come to uh, major policies, how they can change policies, it's very, very slow. Especially we have these you know, hierarchies and all that. It takes time. So the market is uh, going up the, uh, upward, and the policies and governments is still sustained in that, in that uh, place. But what we see also in uh, Gulf countries, they have this ambition to work uh, towards more sustainable uh, and future um, um, planet for, for everyone and for, for the countries itself. Uh, escalation in war uh, in Ukraine, um, the tension in, in Gaza, fragility across the world uh, with conflict, and also um, heat, flooding, drought, and famine is almost uh, their uh, un and unpresented uh, issues. So um, uh, we conclude now with the answers and questions, uh, questions and answers for, uh, for the session. Um, I will uh, start with the question to um, uh, uh, Princess Nora, since she is still with us uh, before uh, we end the, the session. Uh, how does Saudi Vision 2030 advance energy diversifications in the kingdom? And uh, how do Saudi Arabia action stack up against the uh, desire to keep the oil status quo in place? Um, thank you again, Dr. Rafa. Um, I think the, the, the concept of sustainable development, of a cleaner development, is really ingrained and implicit within, the, within Vision 2030. The National Transformation Plan that followed Vision 2030 and, and the policies that came about it clearly stated that by 2030, 50% of our energy mix will come from renewable energy. So I think that in of itself is really pushing the dial in terms of the deployment of renewable energy in the kingdom. Now, we are at maybe around somewhere around 4% 4, 4 or so um, in terms of um, renewable penetration within our in our grid. But I think there is, and a lot of people t tend to criticize that or point that, you know, to, to think that, oh, we're not on track and whatnot. But I think there was there's always this period in time where you are learning um, and it's a period that may be slow but you're learning from your stake and it's always the beginning but then there's this this sharp curve that goes high up and hopefully you can you know is this 2030 target um, ambitious yes of course is it uh, something the we can achieve hopefully we can and if it's not by 2030 then hopefully by 2035 but I think the point here is going towards you know in the right direction and really um, doing it the right way I do, however, sorry, there was one more question that you, you asked me and you followed up on. Yeah, you can just uh, how do Saudi Arabia actions stack uh, up against the desire to keep the oil status quo in place? I don't think it's, it's not a binary thing. I think, I think that the fact that we, we acknowledge that oil will continue to be a, a very important source of our economy and our, and our revenue generation. 
Um, and, and I think it's just a matter of diverse, diversification and not relying on a single source and the volatilities that happen within the oil markets. I think Saudi Arabia continues to play a leadership role in the oil markets and will continue to play that role um, through, through uh, managing oil market volatility. And I think that is really part of of the kingdom's role, historical role, and, and continued role in the future. And I don't think it's an either or situation. Um, I think it's just a renewed approach um, to be relevant in a, in a time of, of global shifts and, and changing dynamics on, on the geopolitical uh, stage, but also on, on the national stage. So for me, I don't think it's an either or situation. I think we're, we're trying to manage between both uh, and harmonize between both um, Solutions, and I think it's a false narrative to think that it's an either or. Because to your point that you know, and, and this is something I actually wanted to comment on. Someone mentioned that you know we're not ready for a transition. I think what we're not ready for is a transformation. Because essentially, where we want to see ourselves by the end of this century is a completely transformed energy system um, and the way we do business. Where we are today, we are in the midst of a transition. It's a slow and gradual transition that will be messy, but we are already in this in the transition. We're not going to you know enter a transition we're already seeing policies being rolled out we're already seeing decisions happening but it's taking different shapes and forms across the world and um, you know some countries are moving faster than others thank you so much princess and uh, we have a question from Amin Mohsen and uh, I think maybe Dr. Sarah you're uh, maybe the best to answer uh, feel free Dr. Baggett and uh, um, ben to answer as uh, as well. So uh, global uh, climate issues are mainly uh, chosen by large emits, Emirates. GGC countries plus uh, Iran and Iraq contribute less than four percent to global emissions. So shifting to remarkable uh, energy in the right uh, is the right will not uh, make much difference in global climate ch uh, challenges. However, water uh, is um, water distill is destroying the Gulf. What is GCC doing uh, to make um, distill more friendly to GWF and not dump the bottle back in the Gulf? So. Well, there were um, good question. There were so many different things in uh, in a question. Uh, I'll try to answer uh, as much as. Uh, um, I can, uh, something uh, that uh, water desalination and all these issues that they were mentioned, uh, what I can see again, Gulf is, uh, when we talk about GCC, so many countries, but uh, some of the countries like Saudi Arabia and UAE, I see that they are uh, employing a lot of innovations uh, and technologies. They're investing into having a less emitting uh, ways to desalinate water. I have um, just yesterday uh, talked with some of the uh, Saudi students that they were working on a pilot plan to use algae for uh, desalination that uh, absorbs carbon. So um, there is a lot of investment in, as mentioned, the human knowledge and technology and innovation to uh, reduce the emissions and uh, at, at the time um, uh, meeting and addressing the, um, the needs of the country. And I do very much agree that the transition has already started. And something that I want us to remember is that while we are talking about transition, we have to think about affordability because of the energy poverty. And it was mentioned some countries are emitting more than the other countries. Uh, Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa where is um, uh, suffering from significant energy poverty. They are the la they're really not contributing much to emissions, but uh, they need to receive that investment uh, and have access to that finance to um, reduce the poverty, but in a way that is uh, environmental friendly. And again, I think that some of the Gulf countries uh, like UAE or Saudi Arabia, they have uh, strong pledges, but not just words, but actual actions to reduce um, the poverty and tackle some of those uh, severe issues that we have. And I think it's important for everywhere in the world to uh, acknowledge that uh, energy poverty and affordability, not just 
at words and uh, keywords, but actually on the ground for the last mile specifically. The other issue that I want to quickly t touch upon, because uh, my colleague uh, Godard mentioned the policy, uh, especially in the United States, uh, is that we are often not shy uh, among ourselves to say in Washington, D.C., we are an echo chamber. So if you look at one party only is uh, focusing on climate change and um, uh, not much energy independence and security. The other side is only fixated on energy security and dependent and not, not much of discussion about energy transition. So while the both sides are just uh, policy oriented and as we are getting closer to election, usually both parties in the US are more focused on their own uh, campaign agendas and uh, it's very hard to find a common ground. We see that companies in the United States, they are having a more pragmatic approach. We have Chevron and Exxon both acquiring uh, two, two companies that are active in Shell. Uh, uh, those uh, acquisitions that Chevron and uh, Exxon to uh, took uh, in those Shell companies is going to help these two companies to maximize the assets and their uh, oil production in the US. Um, and also, on the other side, we just hear that Exxon is, uh, has started in investing and extracting lithium inside the U.S. Again, when we are talking about all these green initiatives in the U.S., everybody is promoting green, um, moving toward an aggressive transition. But if you tell any of them, can we start mine in our backyard in the United States because we need those minerals, they are the first one to oppose that. You know, So we have this dichotomy and all these paradoxes. But when we look at the companies and American companies, U.S. companies, we see they have a more uh, pragmatic view of both having those in investments in fossil fuel uh, that we need um, as part of our future, but also at the same time investing in mining and whatever is required for transition. So uh, hopefully uh, in the US we, we don't have that top to bottom approach. Obviously the policies incentivize or dis dis uh, disincentivize the investment, but we have companies that are having a more uh, pragmatic view of uh, future energy system and where we have to go and where we are heading. Uh, Gulf states are taking a comprehensive approach, investment not only in uh, oil and gas, renewable, nuclear, and also technology to uh, pollute less, and also uh, something very important, uh, investment in energy efficiency, consuming less energy. It is not only about diversifying the energy mix, but also reducing uh, how much we use uh, to produce one point of GDP. Uh, it is also very important to highlight that o producing oil in the Gulf is much less pollut polluting than producing oil here in the US or in Canada or any place in the world. For geological reasons, uh, producing oil and gas in the Gulf is much less polluting than producing in the rest of the world. And last point I want to make, uh, it is very interesting to see, uh, even we are talking about climate change, but Western leaders, big oil producing countries in the Gulf to produce more oil and gas. Uh, because they are, con I mean, President uh, Biden went to Saudi Arabia, to Jeddah, asking Saudi Arabia to produce more oil. And pollution does not recognize political borders. And again, there is need for balancing uh, uh, climate emergency with the needs for economic prosperity. Thank you, Dr. Baggett. Uh, any reports there, Ben, or should I move to the next question? Um, maybe just a, a quick point on the role of natural gas. I think one benefit to the Gulf states of increasing renewable energy generation is that it frees up natural gas, either for domestic use or for export. And natural gas is an important fuel for industrialization. This is a really critical goal in Saudi Arabia, in the UAE, in Oman, and other countries in the region. It could free up more natural gas for export, too, in the form of LNG for pipeline gas uh, for Qatar. Um, and this is a region that, until recently, has been gas short. 
you know, aside from Qatar, right across the GCC, every country was really struggling with maintaining gas self-sufficiency. Now the UAE is looking at a new LNG export project. Um, Qatar is in the midst of this massive LNG export expansion. Over the next decade, really the only two countries in the world that are going to add LNG export capacity are Qatar and the US. That's about it. There's a little bit on the margins. Um, so there are multiple reasons why the GCC countries see the benefits of increasing the share of renewable energy uh, in the electricity system because it's got these broader effects throughout the economy and it frees up more molecules for export as well. And that generates export revenues. Um, and they see that the world is going to need that gas for a long time to come. Thank you. And we still have 10 minutes. So I would have a question and I would ask each uh, speaker to have one minute reflection on that question. So uh, we're starting with you, Ben. Uh, what role will uh, the Gulf countries play at the upcoming uh, COP28 climate conference in Dubai? What criticism do you, uh, do you foresee them facing within their current energy and green development practices, particularly with uh, regards to their continued oil and gas exports? Oh, Just man. one minute for one each minute. one. One minute, that's a tough challenge. <laughs> um, uh, the, the role of the COP presidency this year has been controversial. As you all know, we don't need to get into that. I think this COP will clearly be different. Uh, it's being held in Dubai. There's a clear uh, effort to give the Gulf states more of a voice. I think the UAE also really wants to elevate the voice of the global south. Um, many of the countries that feel they've been left out of climate negotiations in the last couple of years, their concerns about energy access and energy poverty have not played a big role in the agenda. So they want to make that a bigger part of the conversation. There will be the same debates at this COP as there always are. What's the long-term pathway for fossil fuels? How quickly can we get rid of fossil fuels and unabated fossil fuels? What's the role of carbon capture and storage? These are very divisive issues, and I don't think the COP president alone can solve them. Uh, but there is a desire to bring in the private sector into this COP and give it more of a voice to sort of join the outside of the tent groups, you know, all the announcements and the corporate issues that are coming up at COP. It's a big trade show, right? to join that with the climate negotiations happening inside the tent and come up with practical, implementable solutions. That's what they want to do in the UAE. Thank you so much. Right on the time. <laughs> okay, Dr. Baghet. I, I believe the big argument will be over who will pay for uh, energy transition and compensation for uh, climate change disasters. And I, to the best of my knowledge, there is agreement now that uh, the World Bank will be in charge of this. There is a special fund will be created, and uh, there is debate or very intense discussion. Uh, the countries which have polluted more should pay more, uh, and uh, is it related to GNP per capita? So there, is, there will be a great discussion who will pay to compensate for climate change disasters and to help countries to make the transition. And there is a demand for, from demand on oil countries to pay a big share, even they have polluted much less than developed countries. Thank you so much. Also right on the time. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, this is the third COP uh, in the Middle East. We had uh, Egypt and Morocco before this. Um, I think if you look at the previous stock take, uh, global stock takes, uh, I would say that um, the previous ones, uh, moving from previous ones to this one, uh, one is the inclusiveness and energy poverty and a just transition that uh, the COP28 is looking at that to uh, the, make sure that gap between global north and south is not widening and energy poverty is tackled and addressed. The other issue is the financing, that the COP28 is uh, comprehensively looking into that, uh, financing the energy transition. And the third one that I do hope that uh, we are not late for this COP to so. still cover that in the global stock take is the demand management and the not just focusing on 
supply and what type of source of energy we need for supply, but also for demand efficiency, the, uh, demand management, and also type of materials that we are using uh, in, as a part of our global daily use, uh, more sustainable materials. So I do hope that demand part is also going to be included in this, uh, this year's uh, global stock take. Thank you. I appreciate that. Sure. Uh, Princess Nora? Thank you. Um, so I'll focus on it from two different perspectives. One is what's happening in the negotiations. And I think there, again, back to my colleagues' points, there's going to be a huge discussion on, a discussion on the loss and damage fund, who's going to pay, who's going to put money there, and when will that happen, and how to distribute the funds more importantly. And then the second component would, would be about the, the issue of, and I think Ben spoke about this, on the abatement of fossil fuels. Um, in the previous COPs, we have seen, in, starting in Glasgow, the phase down of coal. Uh, it was a phase out and then a move to phase down. Right now, there are language being tossed around about the, the phase down or phase out of fossil fuel. I think realistically, if we're going to come close to anything, it's going to be unabated fossil fuel. And that's even if it will stick, because there's a huge problem of distrust um, that is 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 really um, being detrimental to the conversation and to the to the process of uh, the COP process per se. Um, in terms of what's happening after COP and the trickle down effects of the COP and what's happening in this fair, as as Ben said, I think is really on the financing financing component and more importantly about capacity building and also bankability of projects. Because if we were talking, there was a lot of focus here on developing projects in the global south and in Africa, and the biggest components there is the bankability of projects and the capacities that are on the ground that are able to carry through and follow through on these projects. So these two, I think, is a role of the private sector and the role of the uh, non-state actors with the policies that uh, come in place uh, from from policymakers and the national level. Perfect. Thank you. I like working with this uh, panelist. They're on time. Asking them one minute. <laughs> Everyone is sharp with one, with one minute. So we have last question. We have four minutes left and uh, it's to anyone. Feel free to just uh, jump in and answer the question. Uh, can you uh, talk about Saudi Arabia's interest in acquiring uh, nuclear energy and building power plants in uh, Saudi Arabia? Who is likely to win the uh, contract, China, Russia, or the US? Why is not Saudi Arabia, why is not Saudi Arabia interested in signing the one, uh, two, three agreement? So anyone can jump in, uh, including Princess uh, Nora. I mean, probably I, I, I believe Princess Nora is the best qualified, but I, I would say that nuclear energy is part of diversification. And again, it is, uh, it is not neither nor, and the best way forward is to diversify the energy mix. And nuclear power, like other sources of energy, has its own pluses and minuses. For Saudi Arabia, for sure it is a large country, and Saudi Arabia is interested in diversifying its energy mix, and it makes perfect sense for Saudi Arabia to consider nuclear power. For United States, for different reasons, we have not developed our uh, nuclear industry, and nuclear industry now is dominated by uh, Russia, South Korea, and uh, China, uh, United States is lagging behind, and we are trying to address this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rajad. Um, I think for Saudi, I think there are multiple reasons for that. There are strategic reasons, and also there are techno-economic reasons. I think for the kingdom, we are not leaving any option untapped. We are tapping all options, and we are going to get into, in terms of who we, we agree to go with, whether it's Chinese, Russian, US, I think that's something that's beyond the way above my pay grade and it's something that we'll all find out in the future uh, but i think uh, really there is a focus on on uh, deploying these types of technologies here and also a focus on small modular reactors as uh, reactors as opposed to the bigger um, uh, structures thank you so much and i think we are on time we have uh, two minutes left um, last sentence you would say for each one, last sentence, just within less than one minute. Um, <laughs> 20 seconds. I would say <laughs> people always want to identify winners and losers in the energy transition. There is this fallacy that oil producing countries will be losers, and I think that's silly. The Gulf states can win in lots of different areas in clean energy and traditional energy. 
Good thing about energy, it is not zero-sum game. Everybody can win, <laughs> and I believe this is a good way to end the panel. Sure. Yeah, I echo, uh, I echo my colleagues. I think energy transition is not one unified uh, pattern, and each country and region have their own unique uh, transition. Okay, and I think we lost uh, Princess uh, Nora. Okay. Uh, I will end uh, the panel today with a quote from the uh, MENA Climate uh, Week, which I liked. I hope everyone will like as well. And they said, our life today is made by choices made yesterday. Our life tomorrow will be shaped by choices the world makes now. Between then and now, these choices will shape our tomorrow and ensure sustainable future for next generations. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.